this is Facedia, the source for inclusive, actionable dialogue on funding and creating a better world. If you're building the future, you're in the right place. I'm your host, Skylar Cole. Before we start the show, I'd like to share that if you're listening to the audio podcast, we're also on YouTube. You can watch this episode there as well as check out video exclusive content. If you're already watching from YouTube, thank you. Today, I am so excited to talk with Bob Mason. Bob is a managing partner at Argon Ventures, leading pre-seed stage investments in Boston with a mission to amplify founder energy to launch cutting edge software products and build impactful global businesses. He has been a managing partner at Project 11 Ventures and was previously part of the Techstars Boston Investment Committee. His portfolio includes over 50 startups and access to a network of hundreds of founders. Before his career as an investor, Bob helped found and built industry-shifting products and businesses for two highly successful public companies, ATG, a leading e-commerce and personalization platform, and Brightcove, the market-leading online video platform for enterprise and premium media. In both roles, he provided engineering and product leadership in support of the company's vision and strategy. Bob and I discussed a variety of topics you won't want to miss. Now let's get started. Great. So, Bob, thank you so much for joining me today. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, awesome. So to start, if you could share your background and kind of how you first even got interested in computer science. Yeah, I mean, I got, got com- interested in computer science because of my father. Um, he was an engineer by training. And when I was a young kid, he brought a computer uh, into the house and an Apple to E. And um, he started taking um, his own computer science classes, um, sort of as postgraduate work. Um, I think, I presume, you know, for his, uh, his work, um, uh, sort of education. Um, But he also did some side projects. He worked um, with an allergist to do some, you know, studies around uh, air quality and and, and the like. Um, and of course, you know, as a little kid, what I really started doing was playing games, um, as most people do. But then over time, I kind of learned about what he was doing in computer programming, and I started kind of my own uh, simple computer programming um, through middle school, and so that sort of deepened uh, over time. And then, as with most things in life, um, my real kind of professional capabilities in computers uh, came from my mother or pushed by my mother. Um, So she was the, she led a community center. um, And of all things, you know, the community center needed like brochures and like pamphlets created. um, And so she hired me, uh, you know, uh, with some modest cash uh, to actually produce um, these um, uh, sort of newsletters and flyers and other brochures um, on the computer. So that sort of, in, it made me connect that computers could actually be um, uh, a form of employment. Um, and so I actually built a skill set around desktop publishing and graphic design uh, in conjunction with kind of my uh, emerging skills in, in computer programming. Awesome. And uh, that that's <laughs> funny. If you, mom, has a task, have a kid, let's let yeah, let's exactly. go towards yeah, it, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> so awesome. So you started kind of playing around, seeing if this was an opportunity. Um, so then you went to college, and did you continue mm-hmm. to pursue it there? Um, yeah, yeah. So um, uh, actually, it first started kind of in high school. In high school, I was very fortunate. Um, we had a really great um, computer science program. Um, and this was you know, pretty early. So this would have been um, you know the late 80s. Um, uh, so I got actually a fairly good grounding in the uh, core components of computer programming well before I got to college. Um, and when I went to college, I went to Worcester Polytech, a uh, science and engineering school. My first thought was to actually be an electrical engineer uh, because I wanted to build robots. Um, and, and the reason being is um, my friends and I convinced our electronics teacher to kind of change the class up. Um, typically, the electronics class was, you know, you'd learn how to like wire light bulbs um, and kind of, you know, think about 
you know, the electrification of a house and, you know, circuits and things of that nature. Um, and we convinced him that we should try and build robots instead um, and have competitions where the robots would fight against each other. Um, and for some, you know, fortuitous reason, he encouraged that. Uh, so we spent the year like building these contraptions and, you know, using electricity. And, and so I thought like, oh yeah, that's what I want to do when I, when I go to college, I actually want to be uh, build robots. Um, so I started taking some of the basic courses around uh, electrical engineering um, uh, on for robotics. And I realized how hard the real world is like, you know, getting circuits to work right, getting like the mechanical systems to work like it's just like a bear. Um, and so in parallel, I've been taking computer science classes. And so I decided to kind of just focus on the virtual world where everything could be controlled uh, purely through software. Um, and so I completed a, a computer science degree from uh, Worcester Polytech in 1994 um, and had some uh, great project work at the university. It's a very project oriented um, education um, uh, methodology. And um, in my senior thesis, we actually built a, a little homebrew uh, VR system. So uh, this is you know way back in uh, 1994, uh, we, took together this, this little Nintendo power glove um, and it had these flex sensors in it. We hacked it into a PC so you could use gestures to kind of um, create these very simplistic virtual worlds. Um, and so cool. uh, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, I also learned a lesson in that process and that um, there's always like a competition at the end of the year about like, you know, uh, all the, like what, which is the best project. Um, and um, and and we won um, not because our computer science skills were the best. There were clearly people that solved more important, interesting challenges. Um, but we decided to create a music video um, for our for our for our presentation, and so that taught me the power of marketing. Uh, and sometimes, if you market and storytell your your product uh, better than others, even if it's not technically um, superior, uh, you still grab people's attention. So that was a fun uh, endeavor. Oh, that's awesome. Like make them feel something. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. That is so awesome. Um, so then after college, what did you decide to do or how did you yeah, so continue I've, your uh, so passion? I've, as I, as I mentioned, even in middle school, um, I started getting into graphic design and kind of the visual parts of, uh, of computers. Um, and, you know, my senior thesis was this VR, very graphic oriented thing. So I've always, I was always interested in kind of the intersection of media and technology. Um, I was fortunate to get a internship at Microsoft uh, between between my junior and senior year where I worked on a multimedia CD-ROM, um, which I got to sort of continue to emphasize my sort of interest in media technology. And when I was getting ready to graduate um, college, I came across just kind of serendipitously this job posting for a company in Cambridge called Art Technology Group. Um, and so that kind of piqued my interest, art and technology, like what's going on. Um, I actually had realized I read a little article about them in Wired Magazine, where they had done a very early VR exhibit at the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry. So that kind of aligned. So I just kind of blindly sent in, you know, an email with like, you know, um, inquiring about job opportunities. And um, one cold February, I drove into Harvard Square in, in Cambridge to kind of go to this business. And I had normally been used to typical job interviews where, you know, you full suit and tie and like you're going to General Electric or, uh, you know, these very sort of formal processes. Um, when I go to this uh, door uh, on the side street in, in Cambridge, um, uh, Joe Chung, who is the co-founder and CTO, opened the door and he was in a t-shirt and ripped jeans. Um, and the first thing he said to me was like, oh, Bob, it's great to see you. And I'm in my full suit and tie. Um, I wanted you to meet the rest of the team, but they decided to go snowboarding today instead. Um, and I'm like, wait, where am I? What is this? So that was kind of like my first orientation to what a startup was and kind of startup culture and kind of, you know, uh, I had never really thought about um, the businesses as they get started. Um, and so I did a bunch of part-time work while I was still in college uh, for uh, ATG. 
And when I graduated, um, uh, you know, long story short, you know, eventually I decided to join them as a company. Um, and so it was a little band of us, about 10. Um, we did a lot of random projects to kind of pay the bills at the beginning. Um, it was basically an interactive agency um, where we would get um, hired as, a, as consultants to kind of craft these interactive media experiences. Um, and lo and behold, and you know, some of this is the fortuitous of getting born at the right moment in time, this thing called the internet and the web started taking off. <laughs> And so that became our real core focus. We started building some of the early software um, to deliver personalized websites in, in e-commerce stores. And, and that was kind of the, my first sort of professional uh, foray in, the, in, um, in using my computer science skills is building kind of some of the early infrastructure around uh, web applications. Mm -hmm. And so I believe you stayed at ATG for about 10 years. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So what made you want to stay? <laughs> Well, to be honest, now that I'm, I reflect back so many years ago, um, a certain amount of it on the length is just a sense of loyalty. Um, you know, this is the first job I ever had at college. You know, it was almost like a family. It was this thing I helped build. Um, and I probably should have left um, sooner than I had. Um, and in fact, uh, ultimately, I got le I left um, a little bit of a, a, a fit of... Um, of uh, peak uh, in that like I had ascertained to try and get this um, promotion um, and uh, I and they didn't want to give it to me and I was like okay fine I'm just gonna leave um, which was probably a good thing because I probably should have gotten kicked out uh, of the company uh, so I could go do something new um, but, uh, but anyways going back in time you know you know, as I mentioned, at the early days of ATG, we started building the software infrastructure for early web applications. And as the web was sort of taking off, um, the business just kind of grew like crazy. Um, so at the height of our growth, we went from roughly the 10 of us to over 1,200 employees uh, worldwide. Um, we went public. Uh, it was kind of like all the hoopla um, of that time period which was an amazing learning experience, you know, for me out of college. Um, my role um, is often what they call a senior software architect. So I was coding, I was leading engineering teams, I was designing products um, and kind of building these really highly available systems um, on, on really kind of primitive software platforms um, that we built. Um, and, um, and so that, Part of it was also just, I loved the joy of building these things um, and building this company and, and building the software. Um, and so often it was just the passion of like what we were doing together um, that really sort of, you know, brought me to bear. And, um, you know, it wasn't a, a straight line either um, at the hut, obviously, with the dot-com crash, I kind of had the first of now several major global economic crises. We had to lay off over 900 employees um, at the company. Um, we did figure out you know, a sustainable business model. We kept driving innovation. Um, new leadership team uh, made some acquisitions and, and sort of um, reinforced the sort of core product capabilities that the company had. And after I left, the company was bought by um, Oracle um, and is now a division uh, as part of Oracle, which was um, fantastic that the legacy we built had long-term lasting value. But even in that arc, um, there was a moment in time when I forget the exact number, maybe it was about 40 of us, maybe 50 employees, um, and none of us really got paid for six months. Um, you know, we had cash flow issues as we were transitioning business models from being a services led business with consulting to a product driven sales organization. And um, even as like a mid 20 year old, I kind of gave my life savings to the company to kind of help pay bills um, in the short term. And I don't think anyone really left the company um, at that stage. Now, obviously we had some advantages in that, you know, we're all young. I don't think most people had kids at that stage. We didn't have mortgages, um, but you know, it would have been very easy for everyone to kind of just leave, um, you know, when the, when everything kind of really got tough. Um, but it was almost like a religious belief that we all had about what we could 
what was happening in the world, what we were building, the role we could play. And it, that sort of fervor was a foundation that created the perseverance we needed to kind of get through the tough times um, before we could kind of see the, the promised land of a successful company on the other side. And that that's really exciting to hear, kind of the joy and the fervor, despite kind of all these ups and downs. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, as I often try and remind uh, founders, is startups in particular are, are not easy. Like, they are not for the faint of heart. Um, uh, there's probably more painful days uh, than joyful days, like if you just think about it like rationally. Um, but there is something if you get the right team together and you're working on the right problem um, and and you actually kind of build something from the ground up, it's just an amazing experience to be part of. And and that um, that joy that you find in that building process, I think, is what really drives and motivates um, so many people. Uh, and I want to come back to that at a different yeah. point in the interview. But um, could you ask so once you kind of said ATG, mm -hmm. it's been good. What um what what did you decide to do after that? Yeah, so um as I mentioned, I just quit ATG you know, out of a uh, you know uh, you know because I was um uh, I was kind of you know ostracized probably the wrong word but you know basically said like no we don't want you at, in a senior leadership role here so I was like okay well I'll go figure out something new um, now you know I was very fortunate and privileged um, in that that first company had. Uh, brought some financial success. So I had the opportunity to just quit my job. Um, uh, not everyone has the, the ability to kind of have that freedom to go figure out what they want to do next. Um, and that's just a something that once again, I reflect back now, like, you know, if you achieve financial success um, in some sort of business endeavor, um, what's really wonderful about that is not a fancy car or a new house or, or things of that nature, it's actually freedom. Um, you have freedom to like be intentional with how you want to drive your career and your life and things of that nature. And so I quit my job and I didn't have a plan and I was just going to go try and figure something out. Um, and so I started um, just meeting and talking with a bunch of people and thinking about ideas. And around that time, I, want, I was reflecting back on my interests on media and technology um, because ATG started as kind of this media centric technology company, um, but kind of morphed into a very um, sort of traditional enterprise software company. Um, and I had, this was around 2004. So I was starting to look at the trends that were happening around um, video online. Um, TiVo, I think had come out like the you know, within a couple of years, then um, there was some nascent online video experiments, broadband adoption uh, was starting to uh, increase. And so it struck me that there might be a moment in time um, where you could start building some sort of software platform to help facilitate um, video uh, online um, as sort of a second wave of, of the internet. Um, and so through some mutual friends, um, I got connected uh, with this uh, guy, awesome individual, Jeremy Allaire, um, and he had been thinking of the exact same thing. Um, and so there was just kind of a spark there of like, uh, like uh, a similar vision around where the world was going to go. Um, and so the two of us uh, kind of worked together in an informal capacity for about six months. Um, we would um, research, we would write documents, uh, we would kind of brainstorm, we'd like conceive of product plans. Um, I helped uh, facilitate building like this prototype demo of a vision of what the future of television could be like, um, you know, online. And that was all uh, a different way to sort of um, build trust in a relationship, um, which is really critical for sort of co-founders. And so Jeremy had had um, an insight from his previous role. He had also um, quit his last job and was trying to figure out something new. And he had previously been the CTO of a company called Macromedia, um, which many people may not know, but um, Macromedia was the originator of the flash runtime. Um, and flash, 
coincidentally is being deprecated this year and is no longer a sort of a viable technology, but it was really critical to kind of bring interactive media um, to the web um, at a certain phase of the web's early career. And one of the last things that Jeremy had done was add a, a video codec or video runtime into this Flash um, platform. And he knew that the ubiquity of Flash across um, desktop PCs. And so he knew with the upgrade cycle, like, you know, by the, you know, 2006, 2007, there would essentially be this ubiquitous video runtime that would all be available all across the web. Um, and that was kind of the technical insight of like, yes, now is the time to go build an online video um, uh, system. And so that's what we struck out to do. We built um, an original uh, you know, founding team together, uh, hired a bunch of engineers I had worked with from ATG, um, you know, and then we set out on this mission to kind of build this online video platform. And so we started this uh, before YouTube uh, existed. Um, our focus was primarily working with large media companies and kind of enterprises where obviously YouTube is, um, is obviously like sort of consumer destination and video sharing um, and has morphed into this amazing cultural phenomenon. Um, uh, and for Bright Cove, um, you know, we once again kind of focus on an enterprise B2B strategy. Um, and, you know, I'm proud to say it's now a public company. You know, it's, I think it's got uh, probably 400 employees or so. Um, and I was there for eight years. Um, and as the CTO kind of led a lot of the product strategy and working with our global customers and partners. Um, but that was another wonderful learning experience for me to kind of evolve as a sort of hardcore computer programmer into kind of a business leader, product strategist, uh, executive, um, and uh, and kind of leverage that now for um, as my role as an investor and kind of bring that holistic point of view. Awesome. So speaking of becoming an investor, when did you first start investing? I actually did not start investing until 2011. Um, it, to be honest, it never really struck me like I like there hadn't been a culture of angel investing at ATG mm -hmm. that I was aware of. I wasn't connected to any networks of investors um, as an engineer um, yeah. at ATG. I wasn't involved in that part of the process. Mm -hmm. um, I was involved more with Bright Cove, um, mm -hmm. but Jeremy, my co-founder and the CEO, like he took primary responsibility uh, mm -hmm. for all of that. Um, but in 2011, I got um, introduced from a friend and a colleague of mine uh, at Bright Cove to the Techstars Accelerator yeah. Program. Um, and so I went to my very first demo day in Techstars Boston in 2011. And I was just kind of blown away. Um, I was like, what is, who, who are these people? What is this energy? Like, uh, what are all these people doing and building? Um, mm -hmm. uh, because my personal startup experience um, had been very insular. Um, mm -hmm. We had amazing team members, but we weren't really connected to a community. Like I didn't have mm -hmm. a set of peers that I talked to. Um, it was all about us solving problems internally within the company. And so this notion of a community and an ecosystem kind of rocked my world. And so mm. I kind of dived into the deep end of that. Um, I made, you know, I dipped my toes at least a little bit at the beginning doing some um, angel investments mm. um, and then started mentoring um, and working and advising um, with startup founders and really just found that I, I loved uh, the ability to kind of amplify their efforts mm -hmm. um, and kind of build alongside them. And so that was my uh, slippery slope uh, to becoming an investor was uh, through the Techstars program. Awesome. And so could you share kind of what, what, what in your opinion are some key aspects of the Boston kind of entrepreneurial mm -hmm. ecosystem? Um, well, I think of the Boston ecosystem um, as sort of very integrated into kind of the the various sort of strengths of the city. Um, so, you know, it ranges from you know, financial services, the healthcare, the sort of deep software, um, uh, you know, deep enterprise software. Um, and so there's a diversity, I would say, of kind of problems and spaces that people are working on. I think clearly the academic institutions all through um, the greater New England area have a profound impact on 
bringing talent from all over the world um, to kind of into the city and it becomes this catalyst and cauldron um, uh, to kind of think of new ideas and, and to build new businesses. And I found it to be very sort of supportive. So either as, as new people come into the ecosystem or they're seeking advice um, or guidance or help, um, people are, are often very much sort of in the belief of kind of the give first philosophy where they'll, you know, you know, try and provide some perspective, open a door um, and, and connect someone with, with someone else. Um, and so I found that to be kind of, you know, really nice and, and pleasant um, and a great community to kind of go build something within. We, we like to joke that the bad weather forces us um, in the winter to kind of focus on work as well, um, but that may just be uh, delusional thinking on our part. <laughs> I haven't experienced a Boston winter. I love yeah. the summer, but I'm not quite sure if I can handle the winter yet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, okay, great. So started mentoring and angel investing um, yep. through Techstars, and then um, what made you want to have, do something on your own. Uh, yeah. So, um, so once again, um, I, I was in a fortunate position of, of essentially being able to be really intentional around how I want to manage my life and my career. So uh, after Bright Cove went public in uh, 2012, I quit my job again. Um, uh, I, I was a little bit more um, uh, forward thinking this. I could, I actually hired myself into irrelevancy. So I hired really good people and I like put them in the right positions. And, and by the time at the end of my tenure at Bright Cove, um, uh, I would barely get an email a day uh, of someone asking, you know, which is, that was a sign that was like, I'm no longer needed here. Um, and so I actually um, kind of volunteered um, as a mentor and to work on the investment committee and it kind of helped manage the Techstars Boston program for two years. Um, um, and so that was kind of, you know, my first step in trying to figure out if I want to do this as a profession. Um, and for me, I had around 2012, I'd been reflecting on my experience both at ATG and Bright Cove and, um, and, and our success in sort of creating jobs. Um, and I'm a big believer in the socioeconomic benefits of entrepreneurism of all forms, um, startups, um, you know, and, and the like. And I had reflected that, you know, I probably had a hand in helping create at least a few hundred jobs, um, you know, through those companies. And if I wanted to do that in order of magnitude bigger, like what would be a really appropriate form to go do that? You know, maybe I could create another company and get another team together and create a few more, you know, hundred, hundreds of jobs or thousands of jobs. But, you know, th that's a high risk, you know, proposition. And, and I had been starting to advising and mentoring and doing a little bit of investing in, in startup founders. And it struck me that maybe there was a way where I could just incrementally um, improve the odds of their success um, and then create a chain reaction, right? So if, if I can help a founder create a successful company, um, then they're gonna create employment and then that might spawn more founders that create more companies. And, and therefore we may have sort of a positive ripple effect uh, through our communities and societies uh, in that regard. So that was my kind of my first thought process is like as a socioeconomic mechanism, could I have an impact on helping to create more companies, more successful companies? Um, and then I just found it to be really intellectually stimulating, fun, energizing, kind of working with founders that have super creative ideas that are solving hard problems. Um, and so that's why um, I decided to kind of, you know, really go at it at a, from a professional perspective and launch a venture fund and and look at a way to make it be, um, make my efforts be sort of uh, economically sustainable, right? Um, if I can be a successful investor, then I earn the right to continue to help other founders create companies and have impacts uh, within their industries and markets and create more jobs and more economic vitality. Um, and so that's kind of on the, that's the sort of the mission uh, I've been setting myself on. Now, I, I think that's something that's really exciting about entrepreneurship myself because it provides a chance to solve, you know, the problem of the business, but there's so many positive externalities you said yep. with jobs and the ecosystem, mm -hmm. of course there can be negative externalities too, but definitely something that's very motivating. So you started yeah. with project 11 ventures, um, mm -hmm. 
your fun and yeah. Yeah, so um, Project 11 uh, Ventures was uh, my first seed fund. I did it with two business partners, um, Katie Ray and Reed Sturdivant. They had been the managing directors at Techstar. So we had a relationship that we had built over two years um, uh, and a, a shared vision of what we wanted to do. Um, and so t Project Level was a pretty modest uh, first size fund. Um, uh, we didn't have a real strong thesis. Um, so we invested in a wide range of uh, different sectors from consumer mobile fitness um, to a services company, to a material science company, to kind of deep software infrastructure. Um, but they were all really, really early stage, uh, oftentimes even at company formation. Um, and so we really like kind of that, um, you know, that focus on getting the company off the ground. And so ultimately we built uh, a portfolio of about 21 companies, uh, um, many of which are continue to grow and active and, and be really um, fantastic. Um, obviously in, in the life of a startup, some fail and that's to be expected. Um, and COVID has certainly thrown a loop uh, for, for some uh, derailed plans. And for others, the pandemic has actually accelerated trends uh, in their business. Um, but after doing that for a number of years, ultimately the three of us decided that there were, um, uh, we wanted to kind of go in different directions with our investment careers. Um, so my friends Katie and Reed are now at an MIT affiliated fund called The Engine. Um, and The Inv Engine invests in uh, a, a category of, of companies they call tough tech, um, which can range, um, they've invested in things like fusion power, right? So it's a very, it's like they think of like very long term, um, commercial time horizons in kind of fundamental science and engineering um, uh, capabilities. Um, and I think it's a super awesome endeavor and it's becoming a new pillar within the, the Boston ecosystem. Um, I'm more of a traditional enterprise software cloud uh, person. Um, and so uh, after we decided to go in our different directions, um, I, I decided to launch a new fund, uh, which is Argon Ventures. Um, and to bring it full circle, um, I asked um, one of my friends and sort of close colleagues from the founding days of Brightcove to kind of join me as being an investment partner. So it's been fun to kind of working with him um, in a new form after we started working with each other 15 years ago um, to get this new fund off the ground. Oh, that's awesome. And so Argon Ventures has uh, uh, the intelligent industry solutions thesis. Yes, uh, yeah. So that was, a, that was a lesson that? that I took out of my first fund is um, I think there is value in sort of building a focus um, and building a, a set of concentrations and disciplines and, and point of view in the world. So for Argon Ventures, um, we kind of at, at at the top level classify it as a pre-seed deep tech fund that focuses on um, vertical and enterprise uh, B2B applications and platforms. Um, Intelligent Industry Solutions is kind of a, as a thesis is, is really kind of focused on the, the characteristics of companies that we really like. Um, so first and foremost, um, uh, you know, they are solving some sort of tangible business problem now. Um, and they are leveraging some form of, uh, you know, deep technology, solving a hard engineering problem to create sort of long-term differentiated value um, in the market. Um, and there are three primary characteristics that we think are really interesting or critical. Um, so first and foremost is ultimately they're, they're really about um, enhancing productivity, um, you know, within the corporation or within a, a process. Um, Often the enhanced productivity will drive top line revenue. Um, uh, second is we're big believers in sort of data network effects. Um, so the compounded value of accrued data, data moats. Um, and so many, if not all the businesses that we invest in, you know, build some sort of core IP and competency around sort of data itself. And then sort of third, we, we like to try and think about um, the market that they're operating at a systems level and, and to think about like, if we could bring radical efficiency within that system, how would the market actually transform? Um, and so we look for big opportunities that could have material impacts on, on sort of transforming those markets um, and then kind of think about it from a systems perspective. And a lot of that thesis comes out of our personal experiences and, and sort of reflections that over the last, you know, decade, um, you know, 
we as an industry overall kind of built out these very broad horizontal platforms, you know, starting all the way from cloud computing, you know, big data platforms, now machine learning. Um, and and it, we feel that we're kind of at an inflection point um, where a lot of the new innovation is going to be driven off of business use cases, that people are starting to understand how to use these technologies and apply them to actually solve really specific problems within a wide variety of sort of diverse business sectors. And so that's the, the formulation of how we thought about our fund strategy. So something that you've mentioned before, but I think it's also emphasized at Argonne is amplifying founder energy. Yeah. <laughs> um, could you talk more about what that looks like and why that's so important? Yeah, so at the end of the day, uh, it's their company, right? So the founders and the CEO, like they're making all the key decisions. Um, it's their vision of where they want to drive. Um, but our hope is that leveraging our decades of operational experience of building products, building companies, building teams, um, we can, can really add an accelerant um, to what they're doing. And so we take a very active approach um, with the founders. We, we like to lead and anchor their very first round. Um, we will often work with them sometimes months before they've even raised and for, you know, capital and formed a company. Um, and then after that, you know, we roll up our sleeves. You know, it, it could be you know, doing a deep dive in engineering process. It could be reviewing a legal contract. Um, you know, it could be thinking deeply about pricing or packaging. Um, and so we're often in communications with, um, with the founders on a weekly, if not sometimes daily basis uh, for certain periods of time. But we're really trying to understand why they're building this company. And then how do we get our worldview aligned with that vision to try and help them in as many different uh, little ways as possible. Hey everyone, I wanna take a moment to thank you for listening to Vcedia. I'm excited to connect with others hungry to build a better future. If you share the vision, I'd love to hear from you. For guest and partnership inquiries, send an email to hello at vcedia.com or DM on Twitter at the underscore vcedia. Now back to our conversation. And so uh, you've talked about, you know, what's kind of important for Argon. Could you talk a little bit more about kind of how you go about evaluating founders mm -hmm. um, and, and teams? Yeah, absolutely. So um, you often hear um, people always talk about it's founders, founders, founders. Um, and, you know, that's very true for the, the stage that we operate in. Um, Obviously, if we're investing at company formation, um, pre-product, pre-revenue, there's no real evidence. There's no business metrics. There's no KPIs for us to really evaluate. So it's really about building a trusted relationship with the founders to really understand this question of why. Why are they building this? Why now? Why them? Um, and that's the, the first and, and most important set of criteria that we kind of try and evaluate. And there's a formal rubric that you know we use internally to try and ask questions and almost like a, a checklist to make sure that we're going through um, you know uh, the right evaluation. Um, but then we sort of look at the market opportunity, right? You could have some amazing people, but if the market they're building within is slow growing or there's structural flaws in it, then maybe that's less of a, an interesting business to kind of build within. And so we certainly try and understand the market opportunity within that. And then sort of third and final is kind of the product strategy. Like, well, what are they actually going to build? What is it really going to do? What is the technology that kind of underpins that? Um, and the reason why we have those three priorities is because if you get amazing founders that are intellectually curious, they're continuously learning, and you put them within a market opportunity that um, you know has potential, then over time they'll figure out what the right product is that needs to be built. Um, and but if you kind of lead with the product, um, and the product strategy seems really on target, but you know the founders don't have the skills or the an unfair advantage to go execute that within their market then it doesn't really matter at the end of the day the product and technology is not as important as your go to market and the market opportunity you're, you're within and so something you also kind of mentioned earlier is um 
kind of being able to go through crises and we are mm-hmm. in another uh, yep. time time of crises. What advice do you have for um, kind of either being able to continue yeah. or start or, or wherever you are in the process uh, during these types of times? So there's a couple of lessons that I've taken through my um, uh, my experience as an engineer, um, and, and I know not everything can boil down to um, a logical uh, set of steps, um, but um, you know, there's this methodology that that is often used in sort of product engineering process called Scrum, um, and there's some these key principles around Scrum that I really um, hold up uh, as as important. Um, so first and foremost is kind of building a, a culture of uh, continuous learning. Um, and and retrospection. Um, and so, you know, when you're faced with a crisis, um, you really kind of have to um, be reflective of like what's going well, what's not, um, you know, focus, you know, being really clear about the things you're not going to do, et cetera. Um, and so sitting down and kind of having a regular um, rhythm of being retrospective and kind of looking at like, well, what have we accomplished? What has been successful? What hasn't? What are we going to improve? Um, I think is is really important. Uh, second is this notion of absolute priority uh, around kind of your different business and um, product initiatives. Um, oftentimes, people will throw a whole bunch of stuff into a bucket and say it's all important. And when you do that, it's really hard to actually make tactical day by day, week by week decisions. Um, and so I believe in, in this model of really setting absolute priorities. What is the number one thing that you need to accomplish the second, third, fourth, fifth, et cetera. And that initial sort of triage is, is always really valuable um, in that like it just you know clarifies in your own mind um, the, the relative importance of things um, and can kind of provide focus. But what's really critical, particularly in these types of um, crises is, is everything is so dynamic and changing that you have to be able to adapt really quickly. And so if you have a sense of your baseline priorities when something new happens, either you know, um, maybe you have a new product idea or maybe you have a new market initiative you wanna try, you can actually have a really cogent conversation amongst your peers um, about like it's the, the new ideas relative importance to all the other things that you've prioritized. And, and as often as the case, um, we usually in, initially get enamored by the shiny new object. Um, you know, it sparkles and shines and, and it feels like brand new um, and full of possibility. Um, but if you actually think about it in the context of all the other things that you've already outlined as your priority, it may not actually be that important, right? It may be the 10th most important thing that you need to accomplish. And therefore having the wherewithal to say like, we're not going to worry about it now is a really good idea, but let's put it on the backlog and move on. And let's continue to focus on our top five things. I think is a really critical way to keep the team focused as you're sort of managing, um, through a crisis. Um, I think there's a lot of qualitative ways to help as well. So like, you know, it's really important to have a strong peer network, um, a set of mentors and advisors that um, that are perhaps just ahead of you in your career. So you can learn a little bit from them, but I think also where you can be an advisor to someone else. Um, because oftentimes the process of talking about a problem uh, allows for the solution to be uncovered. And so that's a another lesson I kind of learned out of my engineering days when you're debugging software. Um, you know, you could be pounding your head against the table for hours on not understanding why this bug is in the system. And then you invite your friend to come over. Um, and in the process of talking about what you see as the flaw and what the conditions are, um, and then just asking some questions, um, often you have insight. It's like, oh, now I know what the problem is. Now I see where the issue was. Um, and so that, that process of debugging, um, uh, sometimes people joke called rubber ducking, where you bring a rubber duck to your table and you talk to the rubber duck. Um, but anyways, that process of, of conversational introspection around what you think the problem is with an outsider you know, a supportive friend, um, you know, a colleague, a peer in the industry, I think is so critical to be able to help you um, uh, figure things out. 
And then the, the final piece of advice, which often feels probably the hardest thing to do is actually the step away from the computer. Um, we all spend too much time in kind of the daily urgency of now, um, you know, trying to write that next email, trying to finish that next sales, you know, uh, document or what have you. Um, the reality is if you go for a walk, um, you go for a bike ride, uh, you do some yoga or meditation, it may from the outside world appear as if you're not working. But in fact, what you're doing is you're allowing your brain to have the space to synthesize, process, um, and to think about problems kind of in the back of your head. Um, and I will often have um, the greatest moments of clarity when I'm not at the computer. Um, I'm walking the dog or I'm on a bike ride and kind of that meditative process allows me to really think about problems and, and trying to organize my life in a way that is helpful. So I think particularly in this day and age where, you know, being outdoors can bring solace uh, and health benefits, um, I think trying to carve out a little personal time is, is really critical. Oh, absolutely. I feel like sometimes going for a walk, it's like magic. Like, yes, exactly. Oh, everything's <laughs> coming together. I feel great. The world is brighter. It's it's amazing yeah. how simple things can, can really go a long way. Yeah. Um, but to transition to a different topic, um, we were able to connect through Black VC. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, it's been really energizing for me to be able to see your commitment to diversity in VC and VC and, and supporting uh, startups. And you recently wrote a piece, uh, Venture Diversity is Burdened by the Unnecessary Need for Wealth. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I'll link definitely link that below so everyone should please read it. Uh, but could you share some of your main points uh, from that article and how, how it's been received? Yeah, so um, I wrote the article um, this past spring, um, and it was uh, a reflection of both my personal experience of having recently completed a first close, so having gone through the fundraising process of launching a new fund, and obviously, um, myself and and so many others trying to be reflective around you know the murder of George Floyd and racial strife um, in our country here and like what are what are at least some of the contributing factors that have you know compounded with the lack of diversity um, and inclusion in the startup world and venture capital and the like. Um, and so the conjunction of those two sort of moments of introspection. Um, it dawned on me that like I uh, has come from a point of privilege where like I, ha I had some financial success early in my career so I could invest in my own career. I could in do angel investing, I could build a network. Um, and that became a platform by which I had the privilege of launching um, you know, my own fund. Um, and, and, and systematically and structurally, there's a lot of people that just don't have those, uh, uh, those abilities. And then uh, it's, it struck me as like, it feels like there's this weird paradox between the startup world and startup founders and, um, and it's kind of the founding general partners of a new fund. Um, uh, I, I have, uh, I surmise that many people from, um, uh, with different racial, ethnic, or cultural backgrounds um, would like to get into venture capital. And for a whole host of reasons, they um, those doors haven't been as open to them or accommodating. And so there, we don't see that type of diversity and in investment partners in, in a lot of the, the big funds or a lot of the other uh, different funds that have been created. And so maybe they have an inclination to go start their own fund, right? Um, um, and with a startup founder, when we invest in their company, we have no supposition that like, okay, we're gonna give you $2 million to go you know, build this concept into a business over the next couple of years. Oh, uh, and by the way, like you personally have to go get like $200,000 um, and and add that to the pot. Um, like we, we know that there's alignment financially and structurally because um, you know they're probably getting underpaid from a cash perspective at an early stage startup. They have um, uh, personal stock ownership in the company to kind of you know foresee that, and therefore there's sort of aligned financial upside. Um, they have all the effort um, and the ideas um, and the energy, and we as investors are providing the capital to kind of fuel that. Um, 
But in the general partner world, um, that's not the case. If you're a general partner and you're going to set up a fund, um, you know, there's, there's a, a certain expectation on GP commitment, um, which could be hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars um, uh, over time. It's not all paid up at once, but it's still an accumulation of capital. Um, you know, similarly, you may need to build a track record of, of showing that you're competent and have a good investment eye. Um, perhaps you can build that track record in ways that don't require you to build to spend personal capital, but that's a little rare. Um, and there are some new innovative programs that are kind of helping with that right now. Um, but historically, what you'd have to do is actually just spend your own money. It's like you got to go do angel investing. Um, and once again, that could take tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and if you don't have that wealth, then you can't have a seat at the table. Um, and an LP, which is the limited partners that back venture funds, um, may not give you the opportunity. And so that just felt like to me that there was something incongruous um, in that. And so my hope was at least just to spark a conversation. I don't know what the right answer is to, to the solution, but it did see, does seem a little unnecessary that the only people that can start venture capital funds come from a point of privilege and wealth. Um, uh, and if we could change that dynamic, maybe that would actually be a really important characteristic of changing the diversity of capital allocation and, and the number of venture funds and the like. You know, when I, when you make that parallel, it really made me stop and pause. Like this, <laughs> it's such a, I, I, I mean, I can understand the reasons for, for the way it is, but yeah. it does pro provide these barriers, but like, wow. So putting skin in the game means very different things, whether it's startup or a fun. So mm -hmm. that was, that was kind of great to just see in, in black and white. And once again, like uh, I, I recognize that you need to create alignment between, you know, the, the founder or the general partner and the investors, the limited partners, right? Like that's a fundamental tenet of trust and relationship building. But we have seemed to figure that out in the startup world that doesn't require the startup founder to come up with tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. Um, and so perhaps there's a parallel world that we could implement in the venture world and the venture fund world. Um, and that would aid in helping the diversity um, and greater inclusion of, of capital deployments. Definitely. I'm, I'm excited to see kind of how relationships will change with kind of the status quo of venture capital and people's relationships with it. Um, so now uh, I would love to hear about some trends or things you're excited about technology wise, industry wise, um, maybe in deep tech or, or what you're interested yeah, in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you know, maybe I'll talk a little bit about some of the investments that we've done recently and kind of why we get excited about those. Um, uh, so in Boston in particular, there's a core strength is around healthcare, um, uh, given the institutions and the leading, um, uh, you know, research institutes and, um, and medical schools. Um, and so there's a real burgeoning of sort of talent that sort of comes up in the space. And, and once again, they're kind of thinking about how you could use different forms of, uh, of technology like computer vision and machine learning kind of solve some really tangible problems. So we made an investment in a company called Lumen DX, which is using computer vision um, to do skin disease identification and kind of help primary care doctors and health workers all across the globe. Um, uh, have a more accurate diagnostic and identification uh, around skin disease. Um, and, um, and it's a very sort of, once again, tangible problem. Um, and, and the problem fundamentally is that like, you know, when you go to your primary care physician or you go to, um, you know, a nurse or some of that and you show them a rash or something that is that you're concerned about, um, the reality is like they don't really have much training um, in how to do that identification. And, and the problem space is quite wide because there are literally dozens and dozens and dozens of different types of skin diseases. And if you amplify that across different skin tones, it's a it's a real challenge to actually get a proper uh, diagnosis. Now, if you go to a specialist as, as a dermatologist, yeah, you could get really good, um, uh, often, you know, diagnosis and, and really targeted. But there are a relatively limited number of dermatologists. It's expensive, perhaps, to get that referral. And if we think about it as a global health issue, 
you know, the number of trained dermatologists are not you know, readily available uh, for the global population that we have. And so this seemed like a really interesting problem space where if we could accumulate the right data sets, you know, hundreds of thousands of images are, uh, that are annotated around different skin diseases, we could actually build a computer vision model that essentially puts a dermatologist in the pocket of a doctor and a healthcare worker. Um, and so that, like, I think this notion of like using um, uh, computer vision and uh, machine learning tools as an augmentation, as a decision support tool to healthcare, um, I think is really powerful. It's not about getting the doctor out of the loop. It's actually about empowering them and giving them an extra level of specialization that would just be impossible for them to take um, with training on their own. Um, another area in, in the healthcare space is around um, uh, clinical data research. Um, so for those that aren't familiar, there's a lot of research that happens just by analyzing data, healthcare records, um, genetic studies, things of that nature. Um, and um, there's a, rightly so, there's a very lengthy compliance and legal, tour, legal re regulatory review process of making sure that the data is secure, it's anonymized um, uh, before it can be shared to a clinical researcher to actually do their studies. Um, this can add months, if not years of delays um, to research projects because of the, the review process and making sure that the data is hosted and secured and managed well. So this uh, MIT spin out called Secure AI Lab Sale, um, they kind of flipped the model. They, they use this more novel form of machine learning called federated learning. And they use this other technology called secure enclaves to create a secure computing environment. And what they do is um, they enable a, a researcher to essentially create their algorithms and their predictive models and never have direct access to the data. So basically the data always remains hosted in the healthcare network. And then the research can kind of send their, um, their computation remotely into a distributed system um, have you know the analysis done and the results aggregated brought back to them. And so the goal of this is that you could radically reduce the latency involved in, in, in clinical research um, and actually potentially unlock vast troves of healthcare data that are, could be made available to many more researchers and sort of help accelerate more health discoveries and, and, and pharmacological you know, studies and the like. So I think, once again, this is a way of like, how do we use a new technology to look at a systematic view of a market and kind of reimagine like what the workflow could be like. So instead of figuring out how do we secure the data and transfer it to the researcher, um, maybe we could create a secure open healthcare data marketplace where any researcher in the world could just say, well, what data is available um, I want to build a, a, a research model that analyzes these 20 different research, um, you know, data sets across these five different hospital systems, um, and I can do that in an afternoon. Like, uh, if if that was possible, you know, how much further could our um, our, our research uh, kind of go? Um, and so, you know, those are just like two examples in the healthcare space. But like, it is about having a technical insight. And then figuring out how that technical insight can apply systematically within that market opportunity to kind of fundamentally change the, either the economics or kind of the, the, the dynamics of how that market operates. That's super exciting be, to be able to target a tangible problem that has these broader implications. Yes. Um, yeah. And so something that just seems so apparent in talking to you is your joy for what you do and mm -hmm. the technology and investing. And I'm wondering how you kind of maintain that joy uh, in well, over it's, these um, years. I think it's, it's easy when you're just working with like smart, intellectually curious, passionate people. Um, you know, it's like, uh, you know, when you come home um, and you know a puppy is there, like they're just bouncing off with joy, and like you feed off of that joy. And not that I want to equate founders to puppies, but you know, like you know, like really good founders have an innate joy about what they're trying to do. Now, it's not 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 every moment is joyful. Like there's really like hard moments, but the the passion that they bring to bear, you can kind of feed off of. Um, and so it's just I find it to be very. Um, uh, 
energetic and um, and life fulfilling to kind of help them figure out how to go do that. Um, and uh, you know that that the ability to kind of solve those types of problems uh, is a is a good endeavor for us to try and take on. Oh, that's so awesome. And kind of staying on the topic of fun, we've yep. come to uh, the part of Vesidia geek out where guests get a moment or a minute or two to talk about something that they geek out or nerd out about that's unrelated to work separate from what you do on a daily basis so yeah. Bob, if you would geek out well i um i love being outdoors um and you know that could be hiking walking biking um but in maybe perhaps in the in the, in the geek out sort of mode I, i'd actually um sort of uh highlight my interest in sailing um so so the f last few years, I've really got into sail racing. Um, it's not a big boat, it's a small boat, um, but um, it's amazing how technical and precise um, you have to be in a very fluid environment. Um, so, you know, you've got, um, you know, let's say 10 boats all racing on a course on the ocean in a dynamic wind environment um, uh, and you have sails and lines and you, you got to try and do everything with this really interesting level of precision um, and timing is really, really critical. And so for the last few years, um, uh, uh, myself and some friends, uh, you know, I've been taking classes and really trying to get you know, hone our skills um, and expertise in sailing. And we've seen, a, a, I, I've personally felt like a really vast improvement over that. Um, and so I've really enjoyed the technical aspects of trying to learn how to sail and race um, uh, and sort of elevate my um, capabilities in that. And it's gotten to a stage where like, to be honest, I don't know if I really enjoy just like a leisurely sail outdoors anymore. It's like, you know, it's like, if I'm not like actually racing against other people um, and I can't test my mettle and my competency, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's not as fun uh, as when I can really kind of put all these learnings uh, together. Um, and so the, you know, you all learn all sorts of different things around like different knots and um, different trim ratios and like trying to read the wind and, and read um, how the wind affects the current and like where the tides are. And so there's all like this calculations that you're trying to do uh, in real time in a very fluid dynamic uh, environment. So that's kind of my uh, non-work geek out that I, I like to do in the summer. Sailing in the winter is a, in Boston would be a totally different thing. <laughs> may not may not get too far, but yeah. that, that's that's so interesting, and it sounds like a lot of turbulence. <laughs> I mean, it can be. Um, you know, there will be circumstances where we've been in a really blustery, um, stormy day, and like a, a a big wooden part of the boat will break, and and you're in the middle of the ocean, and then it's like, okay, like how do we deal with this situation? Right, which, which you could say is analogous to crises in a startup, where it's like, okay. Let's stop. Let's assess. Let's make sure yes. everyone's safe, right? Let's prioritize. Um, prioritize. <laughs> um, and so, uh, I often find there's some there's always lessons to be learned uh, in these non-work activities. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Bob. I really appreciate you spending this time to talk with me today. Absolutely, it was it was fun, um, and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for listening to this episode. You can subscribe on your podcast platform of choice. And check us out on YouTube. If you're interested in being featured or know someone who should, send us an email at hello at the city.com. Also, connect with us on Twitter and Instagram at the underscore Visidia for more from our guests, Visidia, and the future of inclusive investment and innovation ecosystems. You can also follow me on Twitter at Skylar Cole. Until next time.